Today on the Mr. Maple Podcast, Matt and Tim discuss fertilization, the do's and don'ts with your Japanese maples. Hey guys, welcome to the Mr. Maple Show. I'm Matt. We greatly appreciate you tuning in to our weekly podcast on Japanese maples and gardening. Hey guys, I'm Tim. We're MrMaple.com. We're a family mail order business. We ship directly to your door. So check us out on MrMaple.com. We specialize in Japanese maples with over a thousand different varieties of Japanese maples. Y'all, we put out a weekly podcast. So make sure you find us on your favorite podcast platform. So make sure you subscribe to us and give us a five-star review that'll help more people see us in that podcast algorithm. Okay, guys, so today we're going to be covering a popular topic for Japanese maples. We're going to be talking about fertilization, and we're going to go through all things fertilization a little bit, hopefully give you some good confidence for what you can be doing to give your Japanese maples the best success rate, you know, what things to avoid, and what fertilizers work best, what fertilizers don't work for Japanese maples, and basically just breaking it all down for you, going through what we do and what we've seen success with, and hopefully you can learn from our failures and from our successes and give yourself more confidence in your Japanese maple gardening. Guys, whenever it comes to fertilizer, the very first book that we were read about that we were trying to figure out, should we fertilize our Japanese maples and what should we do, was J.D. Veritree's book. And Veritree's says, you know, you should use little to no fertilizer on many of your Japanese maples. And so for the longest time, we took that approach. Mm-hmm. When we were first starting out, we took that same approach that J.D. Veritrees did. And the trees, you know, had their natural shapes. The trees definitely, you know, they didn't grow much, but we didn't have any issues with our Japanese maples. As we grew, we began to realize that fertilizer actually helps the plants grow. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot of positive things about fertilizer. But the reason why J.D. Veritrees put in there, you know, you shouldn't really fertilize much he was trying to keep people from making all the mistakes. Right. And there's so many mistakes that you can make with fertilizer that you want to avoid. And, but fertilizer itself is a fantastic thing. The plants grow so much faster with the fertilizer, but you just have to watch out with some key problems that you can face if you're fertilizing them incorrectly. Yeah. I think one of the key things here to address, even before we get started with what to do is what's your end game goal here? Are are you growing a tree that you want to, to grow and be larger? Are you wanting this to stay really small? Are you wanting this, this dwarf tree to not outgrow its location? And so those are factors that may determine whether you need to be fertilizing at all. You know, the majority of trees you see in arboretums that are gorgeous and really in landscapes don't get a lot of fertilizer. There's a lot of natural fertilizer occurring in the ground. There's a lot of organics, you know, leaf breakdown, things like that, that are giving them a natural uh, growth progression. And so you have to ask yourself, you know, why am I fertilizing? Am I wanting to increase the growth rate on this tree? And if the answer is you're not wanting to increase the growth rate a lot, then you shouldn't be fertilizing really. So that, that's part of why J.D. Veritrees probably recommended that is, is, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, this, this, I want this to stay really small. Well, maybe you shouldn't be fertilizing a lot to begin with if that's the plan. I've been to J.D. Veritrees' home and he had a ton of cultivars. He had like 400 cultivars. And he didn't have a lot of room, so it yeah. probably wasn't a good idea for him to fertilize. <laughs> right. He's because like, hey, I'm already out of space here, he, and they keep coming up with more cool ones. He, he's Mr. In a, maple wasn't even around yet. He's in a small lot. His Japanese maples are often pruned back to fit their space mm-hmm. nowadays because there's not a lot of room for them to grow. And I understand very clearly why he would not have encouraged fertilizing because if you have that small space in your garden, you've planted a Japanese maple in there, and you don't want to overgrow that space. Mm-hmm. If you're fertilizing, it's going to overgrow that space. Yeah, and if you've got a perfectly happy, healthy tree in a great location, minimal approach is normally the best way. I mean, certainly you can be adding some fertilizers and some things to help your tree along, but I I always recommend, you know, the least amount possible. Everything you do with your Japanese maple has, you know, some kind of repercussion. So whether it's fertilizing or every step of the way, just be conscious of that because there's always some trade-off with anything you do. Now, on the flip side of things, while we were not fertilizing, we started seeing other nurseries that were fertilizing, but fertilizing too much. Mm-hmm. And they would take something like fish emulsion and just 
grow a, a four or five foot whip in a year. Yeah. And, you know, that was right around that time the 07 freeze happened in our area. Mm-hmm. And their entire crop, unfortunately, got wiped out. And it was because they had stretched the cell walls so much by over fertilizing their Japanese maple that their plant couldn't handle that stress of that cold spell that happened in that, you know, that 07, 08 freeze. Yeah, fertilizers can give Japanese maples a bad name. Japanese maples are very durable when fertilized responsibly. I always like to let people know, I mean, I could get a six foot one gallon in a year, but it just wouldn't winter well. Those cell walls would be too stretched out. It wouldn't be durable enough for our zone six winters. We're here in Western North Carolina where Mr. Maple's located. We're actually very close to Hendersonville, North Carolina. And we, we often get zone six winters here. Uh, that can be down to negative 10 in our location. And so we have to be very careful to not over fertilize trees because those over pushed trees do not winter as well. And, and, and that can give Japanese maples, I would say a little bit more of a bad name. They're not a, they're not a tender plant. They're actually an extremely cold hardy plant. And natively, they can go into some really cold ranges. So it's actually a plant that can handle a good bit of cold weather when they're not over pushed. Naturally, they're not going to get that extended growth rate that you can that you can provide. Uh, so be conscious where you're getting your Japanese maples, what they're putting on them. And we're going to give you some steps about different fertilizers. But some a factor to note is if your tree has grown too quickly, it might not be as quality as you think. It, you know, buying the the fastest growing biggest one might not always be the best choice. Uh, one thing that can give maples bad names are some of the ones we'll see at some of the big box stores. Maybe over pushed to get, you know, everybody's wanting a bigger tree. Bigger trees are more valuable, right? So <laughs> if you the biggest tree possible is, tends to be the race in the nursery industry. So you have to be careful that your trees haven't been over fertilized in a much warmer zone. You know, coming from the West Coast and Oregon, a lot of places are going to be closer to a zone eight. So that that winter fertilization might not make as much difference until it gets to a zone five or a zone six. Now, on the flip side of things, that over-fertilizing can cause issue in high heat areas too. Mm. I mean, when you have a drought or a stress on that plant, when that cell the cell wall is stretched out. Now, the cell wall in the Japanese maple is what takes the nutrients and water from the roots of the tree all the way to the top of the tree. And if you stretch that out, basically you're making it have smaller arteries. And so when you have some sort of stress like a drought or something like that that happens to this plant it's not going to be able to handle its stress as well as it would if it had that thicker cell wall. So over-fertilizing can cause you a lot of issues and cause more rampant disease like Pseudomonas and verticillium because those are essentially clogged arteries. Right. And if you have smaller cell walls, you've got smaller arteries. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about some of the problems with over-fertilization more before we get into this. There's several things. Uh, you know, we do a lot of really weird plants. We do over 1,500 different varieties of Japanese maples here at Mr. Maple. And over-fertilized trees can lose their variegation. They can change colors. They can be a little less desirable than a tree grown at a more moderate pace. Another issue there is that several dwarfs will look like everything else. So you can kind of over-fertilize the natural habit of your unique Japanese maple. And therefore, you could be getting one that you know, isn't shaped like the natural habit that you want from that dwarf. So just because it can grow that quickly doesn't really mean that it's the most desirable if it is grown that quickly. And if you are fertilizing with a lot of, say, nitrogen or something like that, whenever your plant does go through a stress, it's going to get more chlorophyll into the leaf. And that means that it may have less variegation. It may have less red color in the leaf, mm -hmm. maybe less yellow. And once that chlorophyll is in the leaf, it's harder to get that color back to its right stage at least that year mm -hmm. the following year often those colors will come back on many of the types some of the times on variegation though you may actually fertilize out the variegation and cause a reversion now trees that are over fertilized are actually going to underperform in full sun they're going to underperform in cold climates and they're going to take any of those natural stresses that we provide in our gardens and amplify them so you have to be careful with trees that aren't over pushed it's that breaking down of the cell wall. It's that large amount of new growth shoots. Uh, oftentimes, those are the ones that get burned back in the winter anyway because that new growth didn't have time to harden off well before that cold came in. And what it often leads to is a splitting of the base. People will send me pictures of the base of their Japanese maple, and they'll say, do you think this is an insect? Do you think an animal's been chewing at this? And I said, no, I think it's had too much fertilizer and it froze and cracked during the winter months. So too active during the winter can keep that sap really high in the tree. 
And what it often leads to is a little bit more of a cracking at the base, and it could actually be one of the most damaging things for a Japanese maple is to stay too active, especially, you know, we're zone 6B here, like I'd like to tell people, especially in that zone 6 and zone 5 climate, over-fertilizing is one of the biggest mistakes people make. And over-fertilizing during the wrong time of the season, too, can promote growth later on in the season. Like Matt was talking about, you can actually have the base freeze and crack as well, but you can also have the tree pushing on so much new growth from fertilizing too late in the season that that tree gets a lot of damage from those early frosts in the fall. And you just have too soft a growth that hasn't hardened off because you've been fertilizing. Yeah. You're encouraging growth every time you fertilize. If you fertilize too late in the season, you're going to get a lot of damage, which can cause some of that tip dieback on some of your Japanese maples. Now, we'll, we'll get into more about the different types of fertilizer in a little bit, but I always like to bring up during this time frame, uh, you know, some of those bag releases, especially granulateds, can be very slow release, and slow release fertilizers are ideal for Japanese maples, but some of those slow releases could be releasing much later than you want. So if you're fertilizing your Japanese maples, we try to responsibly cut off any fertilizing here at our nursery after May. And the reason we do that is to give the trees plenty of time to shut down. Sometimes you'll see fertilizers that say a 180-day release. So if you're fertilizing plants even around Japanese maples in your garden, if you're fertilizing grass in your garden that, that's close to Japanese maples and they're getting a lot of you know uh, residual nitrogen and residual fertilizers from that grass you're fertilizing, be cautious because what you could be doing, especially with the slow release, is you could be activating those trees going into fall. So you could be giving them way too much nitrogen or, you know, even in August, and a 180-day release from August could be well after some of our heavy freezes here in North Carolina, well after some of our heavy cold spells. It's not uncommon for us in October here to have a few days where we can almost touch that upper 20s, so some decent freezes. We're not getting into hard freezes yet here in North Carolina, but that could definitely cause some damage on some tender new growth. If those Japanese maples are shutting down and going dormant and the natural progression of fall color, they can handle a lot. But if they're very tender and new growth and they're trying to act like it's spring and they're putting on that spring flush, uh, that can be brutal for the growth and the happiness of the tree. Now, one thing to keep in mind with fertilizer, again, we're just talking about all the problems with fertilizer first. Um, we're going to get into some of the, the good things and how to and when to later. But often with fertilizer, I've seen a lot of people take a granular fertilizer and put it out on their plants in a very hot climate when they have a drought. Mm -hmm. And that can actually cause burn on your Japanese maple. Even so applied, just like a weed killer. E even whenever you think that you've applied the correct amount because the fertilizer needs water to be able to really function properly. The plant needs fer the, all the water and the fertilizer to be able to take it up. And without the water, fertilizer can just burn it. Also, if you're not putting out the right rate, you, can, you may burn your... Japanese maple with fertilizer. So always make sure to read your packaging on your fertilizer. Every fertilizer is different. Make sure you're putting out the recommended rate of the fertilizer on your tree. Yeah, it, it's something to pay you know, really close attention to when you're doing this. Uh, it often can look like it got hit with a little bit of a lighter. And, you know, people think their, uh, their tree is burning in the sun. And really what's happening is they're getting a little bit of fertilizer burn. Uh, and and it's a it can be a repeating cycle of bad here because they think the tree doesn't have enough water, so they overwater it, and then you've got an overwatered tree with a lot of fertilizer, and you're more likely to be set up for disease or bacteria in that kind of situation. With an over fertilized tree, you know the tree's getting all the indicators that it needs to grow, but it's got too much water, so that's going to cause issues for it. So just be careful there. Uh, if you see a, a light burning on the leaves, it typically comes from staying too wet. That's the most common reason, but it also can come from too much fertilizer. And as Matt mentioned earlier, weed killer is essentially, it, it makes the plant grow so fast that it kills itself. Mm -hmm. So if you over fertilize your Japanese maple, you will kill your Japanese maple. Yeah. So do be very careful with the fertilizer. I mean, there's so many things that you can do wrong with it. And I understand. I mean, this is why Veritree said don't fertilize much is because right. of all these problems that it can cause. And then there's types like Yube that he introduced that's an unstable variegated type that if you fertilized it a lot, you're going to get more of the solid red branches and none of the variegation with it. Right. And you can't just lose some of the natural beauty of Japanese maples when they're over pushed. I think, I think over pushed trees are real obvious sometimes and you can lose a little bit of that natural beauty that you, you know, enjoy, you know, each Japanese maple tree should be unique. They should have a characteristic kind of under themselves, especially how they're grown. 
And you can you can kind of see differences in over pushed trees. They have uh, you know too uniform of a shape. They look too symmetrical. They they've stretched out too fast, and they don't look like um, individual characteristics of each cultivar. And that's really the, something you don't want to miss out on. I think what really makes Japanese maple so special is that diversity of cultivars. So you can have you know so many different interesting plants. You don't necessarily want your uh, your Kiyohime to look like your Emperor One. And too much fertilizer can create a situation where they're where they're too close together because you've kind of you've kind of pushed the natural instincts of this tree to its limits. Now we fertilize because we actually started seeing a big difference in the health and the vigor of the plants that we were growing, the ones that we fertilized and the ones that we didn't. And I'm glad that we started out not fertilizing. Yeah, I think it it taught us more about the trees on how they should grow, how they should be shaped naturally, and what to really look out for when we see changes on the plants that we may be over fertilizing. So we learned a lot during that process of the not fertilizing and fertilizing the plants just grow so much better. I mean, if you see the plants, you're going to see a plant that's twice the size that's fertilized versus one that's not. Right. And it, it, it sounds ridiculous, but fertilizer makes the plants grow. <laughs> right. right. I think back to, uh, we went to the phytotron with Carol Savates and she's a professor at NC state. And she said, here's where we prove to people that fertilizer makes plants grow faster. And so it's one of her first steps, you know, is making people believe that it actually works. It's not just magic. And so that even works with horticulture students. Uh, But yeah, fertilizer will make your trees grow faster and sometimes healthier. So uh, definitely healthier if you're doing it the right way. Uh, Now, uh, we fertilize, uh, you know, very limited amounts. And we also, like I said, we take it into moderation and we try to cut off that fertilizing after May. That's one of the very important things. One thing I like to stress before we get into, you know, a little bit of why we fertilize too, is if you're buying a Japanese maple from a nursery, especially I'd like to think you'd want to buy one from Mr. Maple since we provide all this great free content. But if you're buying a Japanese maple from us, it's important to note, was it already fertilized that year? And we put out all of our fertilizer in the spring. So if you're buying a tree from us in July, there's very little need to be fertilizing your tree. It's already had everything it's going to need for that season, for that entire year, really. And the next time you should be thinking about fertilizing would really be the following spring. So, you know, if you're buying a Japanese maple and it's healthy and happy, you know, moderation is best. You don't want to be going and putting another fertilizer on top of what's already been done that season. Now, whenever it comes to fertilizer, we've got three numbers. We've got NPK. And many of you all may have heard that but not really known what that actually means. Those are letters, Tim. (laughs) But those numbers correlate to those letters. So like something like 10, 10, 10 would mean a 10 rating on nitrogen, a 10 rating on phosphorus, and a 10 rating on potassium because we've got the N, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, which is the P, and the K, which is the symbol for potassium, even though, you know, potassium also starts with a P. (laughs) Yeah, we'll make it real confusing. (laughs) So that NPK is basically the breakdown. Uh, Every single time you're going to see it kind of written out that way on commercial fertilizers, Uh, even if it's written in that order, but it doesn't say NPK on the bag, you can pretty much assume your 10, 10, 10 is a breakdown of those same elements. Uh, it's a great uh, starting point, and it gives you the instructions for what you're actually doing. Now, each fertilizer is going to come with its own individual instructions. It, everybody wants me to say, buy you know, this specific brand, and it's not always that easy because it can vary per area, and it definitely can vary per dosage rate. But, but the key here is that you're not overdoing any of these aspects. The, the nitrogen is an interesting part of the whole thing, and it's probably the most important part. I would say a lot of popular Japanese maple fertilizers ignore the nitrogen element here, uh, and they go too low. So a lot of the ones that people are sold, and they can be quite pricey, and I'm not going to bash any brands here, but they can be quite pricey for a small amount of fertilizer. And in my opinion, really all they're doing is marketing you very cheap fertilizer at a high price because it says Japanese maples on it. So you got to be careful there that the nitrogen you're getting is actually has enough value for the price you're paying. So the nitrogen really is the part that's going to get everything going. Uh, Typically what we use here is like uh, a 15 or lower on that nitrogen number. And that's going to make a big difference toward the growth rate of the plant. I think, you know, if you're above a six, it's helping. I think if you're below a six or a seven, you know, be careful what you're paying for because you're not getting enough growth stimulation with your nitrogen number to be worthy of a lot of money. I mean, if you're putting out something that's a four, three, four, it's not really putting out something 
in your garden that may even be worth your time. I mean, your leaf dander is going to probably give you a four. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I mean, it, it's not a very strong fertilizer. And again, people make mistakes with over-fertilizing, yeah. but a 10-10-10 is very easy to use and is much cheaper than most of these uh, fertilizers that are labeled for Japanese maples. It's balanced, and it's something that you can put out, and you're going to see a difference in the growth rate of that plant. Yeah, now phosphorus is that middle number. That's the P. And this area is important for a lot of plants. It's not as important for Japanese maples uh, as that in. You definitely want to have a little bit of in there to at least give it some push and some growth, uh, you know, or you're, or you're negating your whole point to why you fertilize. So the, the phosphorus typically stimulates flowering, seed growth, and root formation. So we definitely want some phosphorus elements in there to increase those aspects of our growth and give us an overall healthy plant, especially that root stimulator. Uh, phosphorus is going to increase root growth. Uh, now, we typically go with something like an eight or so. Six to eight in that kind of range on Japanese maples is great. You could go higher. You know, again, a 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 it's not going to hurt anything having something that high. You don't want to go super high on those numbers. Uh, again, you want to keep it more in a balance. But uh, we go typically somewhere between an eight and a 10 if, if we're using that for the middle number there. And uh, it, it can make a huge difference because you are going to stimulate root growth with this. Maple's, you know, not really known for their flowering and seeding, but you can increase those things by using a nice level of phosphorus. Now, your last number was your potassium, and that really helps with the vigor of your plant, mm. but it also helps your tree really take up nutrients and help fight off diseases. It really helps with the health of your arteries of your plant. Yeah, we typically go with something around a 6. Uh, again, we'll kind of hover in that 6 to 8 range, maybe a 10 uh, but but we try not to go much higher than that. Um, typically, what we use here, I think we get a you know complete made up mix here that we have uh, brought to us in large numbers, and we use a slow release fertilizer that is a fifteen eight six, and that's well balanced for Japanese maples as long as it's slow released. But what you don't want to do is you know have a thirty and then you know a zero eight or something that can that can cause more issues for you. And so the balance there is important. Uh, it's good to have all these elements too. I mean, the the potassium is shown to uh, decrease diseases in plants. It's shown to uh, help fight off uh, diseases and basically improve the overall health of the plant. It's going to make a big difference toward vigor if it's a healthy, happy plant. And so having that right balance there is important. And that's exactly what we use is a 15-8-6 for our NPK ratio. Now, I'm not saying by any means that's the only ratio you can use. Because Japanese maples grow in a litany of different ranges. You know, we're here in Western North Carolina in zone 6B, and this is what works great for us. But you can grow Japanese maples zones 5 through 9. And so in a wide range of areas, and something we might do for nitrogen might be a little bit high for, say, like Dallas. Now, while we do use this fertilizer that Matt talked about, we also incorporate Micromax into our potting soil at about 6 pounds per yard. And what that does is that helps the it gives you all the micronutrients that plants crave. <laughs> <laughs> Brondo. <laughs> it's got the electrolytes plants crave. <laughs> Extra points if you know what movie that's from. But uh we we like including that micromax. It really just helps the overall health of the plants and make sure that we're not missing anything out in our unnatural potting soil. Mm -hmm. And and that's just the extra thing that we do on top of the fertilizing that really helps that make sure that we have a healthy plant. Now, it's important to fertilize plants in containers because they are in, you know, a small environment. You've created basically a small environment for your plant. Uh, over time, they're going to need some fertilizers and some nutrition in that setting. It's important to also know what elements are in your natural soil. So it's not a bad idea if you're going to be fertilizing a lot to go ahead and get your soil tested. Your soil could have a lot of nitrogen naturally to it, and you might be, you know, not needing to add much to it. Really good garden soils have a lot of good things there going on. So it just depends on, you know, your, your whole breakdown of your yard. Uh, that, that could also change what you're looking for and what you're looking to amend your soil with and how you're going to be growing your Japanese maple. So, Matt, liquid versus granular. People always ask this as they say, which should I do? Should I do liquid or granular? I'll give you the, uh, the Rodney Dangerfield answer. I disqualify myself because I dated them both. <laughs> so, so the truth of the matter is, you can use liquid and granulated fertilizers. We use both here at our nursery. Uh, we prefer, uh, you know, a primary fertilizer that's granulated because it's more consistent. Uh, liquid fertilizers are great 
given the time frame uh, of when they're being applied to perk a tree up, to increase growth rate during the spring seasons. You have to be careful with liquid fertilizers not to overuse them because the problem is people see that growth and they see that flush and they say, oh, wow, we can do more. And so, you know, everything bigger is always better. So it's easy to apply too much liquid fertilizer, I would say, more than the granulated. So you have to be a little bit more careful there. But uh, I don't think you have to limit yourself to one or the other. I think both work, especially when used, you know, in smaller amounts. Uh, if As long as you're getting your, your granulated fertilizer out at the right time, and you're not using liquid fertilizers too late in the season, I think a combination of the two can work great. Yeah, and granulars, they often have a, a, you know, like 30 days until they really even start releasing. And where something like a liquid fertilizer can release right away. And so it's something to pay attention to because if you have a plant that's struggling, that you're like, hey, this plant has went through some sort of stress and I want to help this out. Say we've went through a frost. Mm-hmm. A granular isn't really going to help that much right away. It's not going to release quick enough to get 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 what you need. Yeah. And so something like a liquid fertilizer will really help that plant get in that growing mode, give it some food because those leaves are damaged to get that plant perked back up. And one of the things I love about the liquid fertilizer during these times too, is your, you know, we talked about if you don't give a plant the water, whenever you're giving it the fertilizer, it doesn't really work. Well, the liquid already has water with it. Mm -hmm. And so you're giving it liquid that it can take up very quickly with fertilizer. It can take up very quickly. So when your plant's stressed, liquid fertilizer is your best friend where granular really helps with the overall growth for that season. Now, I recommend doing your granular early. Like I said, we cut off all of ours after May. I typically don't want to fertilize too early because you don't want to get that nitrogen spike and then leafing your plants out early. You know, we're in Western North Carolina, so we plan for those late frosts. It's part of something that's going to affect us every single year here. Uh, so we're careful not to fertilize too early in the season with liquid or granulated fertilizers. But I think when you fertilize early with a granulated, you've kind of laid that base. It's okay to overlay some liquid fertilization in there. Uh, you got to be careful. So like I said, it's it's easy to see success with liquid fertilizer, then overdo it. Uh, I recommend two to three weeks minimum between fertilizing during the spring growing season and then not doing any after the spring growing season. So two to three weeks minimum, especially if you're trying to pick something up, you know, say you had some damaged buds you had aphid damage, you had frost damage, and you're trying to pick a tree up, that liquid fertilizer can go a long way to helping it throw buds and leaf formation back on because of that instant nitrogen. But too much can be just as much a problem as the granulated. Two to three weeks minimum between uh, dosages of liquid fertilizer. And again, you know, be a minimalist there. It's going gonna, gonna to do better if you're, if you're not going too hard. So if your plant's lost all of its leaves from a frost in the spring, hit it with some liquid fertilizer, come back two or three weeks later, hit it again, and you want to keep giving it that liquid fertilizer every two to three weeks until you see growth or you see that that plant has either declined and and not made it. So typically if you give it liquid fertilizer every two to three weeks, that plant's going to pop back on with new growth. And once it's got new growth, you don't need to keep liquid fertilizing it. There is such a thing as a residual buildup of salts from over-fertilizing your plants. Mm -hmm. And once you get too much salts on your plant, you can't actually have a decline of the overall health because you can almost create a toxicity to your Japanese maple that it just can't handle. Yeah, you're just going to be opening yourself up for more diseases if you're overdoing it to the max. There's a healthy balance there of new growth, of increasing the disease resistance, increasing the growth rate, and you know making an overall healthier plant, increasing all the aspects of what Japanese maples need, that root growth, but then not overstimulating it to the point where you start to break down those cell walls. And so it is a happy balance there. You know, your area could be uh, different in that you have an extreme amount of heat, so you're having to go lower on fertilizers because you don't want to burn them up too quickly. So it's something to be cautious of. And there's not a one-size-fits-all. I think everybody asks us here at this stage, you know, what brand to use. Uh, we've mentioned 10, 10, 10, which is one of the most common Osmocote releases. Now, Osmocote is heat release, so be careful there too because – there's multiple different types of granulated releases. Uh, most of them are either time release through heat or water. And so you have to be careful there. Water is going to break down some of these fertilizers over time. Sometimes they're going to be heat release. So if we're putting out a really high number of heat release and say we're having a drought, well, all that heat release, say you put out a 20, 20, 20. Well, all we're going to be doing is giving that tree the extreme amount of push in its highest heat time. What's typically going to be one of the cool, the least 
water times for the plant. So you're going to increase the heat. You're going to increase the push, but you're going to give it less water because you're not going to be getting as much rain if it's peak season. So you got to be careful there that you're not uh, stressing the tree out in the summer because you've given it, you know, something that's going to be heat released and it's coming out too quick, too fast all at once. So be cautious of that, especially with the mixes. Um, so brand matters a lot less than the NPK and brand matters a lot less than following the instructions. Those are really two of the biggest key elements there. And you want to follow the individual instructions specifically for your package completely. I know that sounds silly to a lot of gardeners, but I have a lot of people ask me and they'll, they'll say, I bought this fertilizer. How much should I put out? And they're almost offended when I say, well, go back and read the bag and see what the dosage rate is on that because they want me to say, well, two tablespoons, but it, it all fertilizers are not created the same. So you want to be very careful that, you know, you're not putting out something that's way too much per that dosage rate or that time release schedule that you're looking for. And the slower you can release these elements and the earlier you can get started with the easiest amount of dosage, that's going to be the best success. And one thing to watch out for too, Matt mentioned this a little bit, there are different styles of fertilizer. If you're in a high heat Texas situation, or if you're growing inside cold frames where they get really hot during the summer, a heat released fertilizer probably isn't going to be the best solution for you. A water released fertilizer might be more efficient for you. And there can be, there's granulars of both. I mean, there's granulars that are released based on the water that comes down, basically takes the fertilizer and allows it to dissipate. And then when the, there's others that when the heat increases, it dissipates into your plant. And if you have it when the heat dissipates it and you're in a high heat situation, during those summer months, you can really burn your Japanese maples with that style of fertilizer. So do be extra careful with that. I mean, we've heard of nurseries burning their entire crops of certain plants because they use the heat uh, released granular fertilizer on plants in cold frames that got to high temperatures. So let's talk a little bit about organic fertilizers. So uh, I would say sometimes I tend to avoid organic fertilizers with Japanese maples, although there certainly can be ones that work. Uh, people will ask us this all the time. You know, can I use this organic fertilizer? I used it on this plant. Can I use it on my Japanese maples? And the honest answer is sometimes I don't know. I mean, honestly, sometimes I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea. I've never used that. I don't have any experience with it. Organic fertilizers are typically plant, animal, or mineral-based. And so the dangers there are what level of nitrogen are we reaching. Sometimes we don't have those as defined. You know, an easy plant-based organic fertilizer that we all know is cow manure. Well, will cow manure make your tree grow? Yes, it will. But that nitrogen can be way too extreme for your tree. You're going to get way more likely to, uh, to get a lot of leaf burn going on from that nitrogen from cow manure if you haven't heavily regulated that down, blended it, and incre- you know decreased the amount of high nitrogen you're spiking your tree with. Nine times out of ten, when somebody puts any cow manure around Japanese maple, they're going to get burned foliage. Now, the biggest issue I see with a lot of the organic fertilizers isn't necessarily the fact that it's organic. The issue is is how it releases. Mm -hmm. And often the organic fertilizers release fairly fast, but then again, they don't have the liquid that the liquid fertilizers have. Right. And so because of them being organic, they're often dropping a large amount of nitrogen on the plants whenever you're putting them out. Yeah, and And, they can be a good amount of nutrients for the plant. The main advantage that the synthetics have for the Japanese maples are it's easier to control when it's released and how it's released. So there's a little bit more control aspect to that than with the organics. And there's some great organic fertilizers that are out there on the market that have different release mechanisms, uh, but organic fertilizers that are typically homemade Mm -hmm. or that that's where we see the biggest issues are when people try to do their own organically fertilized Japanese maples. That's when you see that Higashiyama that's all green. That's when you see the butterfly that has no variegation left in it or the emperor one that's lime green. That makes no sense why it's that lime green. Uh, Because sometimes our, you know, our numbers, you know, we're trying to avoid a 15 or higher on that nitrogen. And uh, to be honest with you, some of our, especially our own homemade versions of these, there's really no way of regulating how high nitrogen we're releasing on there. Uh, And so you can get some really weird stuff going on with your Japanese maples with organic fertilizers. 
with the best of intentions, just because you spike that number so high, uh, you know, it'll definitely screw up the colors and the growth rate a little bit. Now, one fertilizer that is more organic in nature that I've seen a lot of issues with that's often a liquid fertilizer is fish emulsion. Mm -hmm. And you'll see this often used and people will use it with Japanese maples and used every once in a while, you know, you're not going to have an issue. Mm -hmm. But fish emulsion itself, if you constantly use it with Japanese maples, it will eventually kill your Japanese maple as it builds that salt buildup. And uh, it it builds up a toxicity to the plant. It'll stretch out a Japanese maple and make it grow too fast really quickly because it is really, really high in that nitrogen. Just having that fish emulsion in there, uh, it's it's just really, really high uh, nitrogen on your Japanese maple. Now, in moderation, fish emulsion and kelp can be good products. I always like to let people know that kelp's another, uh, you know, organic fertilizer that can be used. You still have to be careful with kelp because it can lead to a salt buildup. Uh, you just have to be careful with those numbers and look at it. I've seen too much done of either. But fish emulsion and kelp, when used in moderation during the right time of the year, you know, during the spring growing season, can lead to good growth. You just have to be very, very careful with those things. Uh, you know, I often get asked about all these different organics that bonsai guys create, like a bone meal and things like that. And uh, you just have to be careful. The honest answer is the nitrogen is your your worst enemy on some of these things because it can flush too hard and it can kind of just be unregulated in how it's distributed. Now, kelp is a great product to use if you've transplanted a Japanese maple. What it often does is it puts a lot of energy towards producing roots and really helping that plant get its vigor back and really producing those white fibrous roots that can be often damaged when you transplant a Japanese maple. Mm -hmm. So that's an awesome, awesome fertilizer to have on hand, you know, if your plant if you're moving plants from one place to another. I mean, the Japanese have been using kelp for years, and it's an amazing, I mean, it's filled with vitamin B. I mean, that's, mm. that's really its, its key essential thing is that vitamin B really helps promote that essential root growth. It's got the electrolytes plants crave. It does, it does. So it's good stuff. Um, you know, be conscious of all these different steps. Uh, we often get asked, uh, you know, about liquid fertilizers. The main one we typically use is miracle Grow. Uh, in in stress plants in the ground. Uh, There's lots of different versions that you can use. Be conscious of not having too high nitrogen. So check your labels, check your your, uh, instructions very, very carefully on that. Uh, But there's a lot of different fertilizers that are going to go out and they're going to work. They're going to increase the growth rate of your Japanese maple. Moderation is always your key there. Uh, And so, you know, just be careful that you're not going too hard in one way. Uh, You know, often people talk about Super Thrive. We'll talk about Super Thrive for a second. Uh, some people claim that it's uh, snake oil medicine, that there's nothing in Super Thrive that helps. Uh, Ted Stevens, I trust pretty well. Ted Stevens is a mentor to us, and he said, well, if they want to study on it, they can come study my place. Ted's a big believer in Super Thrive. I've, I've had interesting, intelligent people have different opinions on this. Uh, it's something we have had seen success with. Now, is the success in that you're doing a much better job with your plant? So Super Thrive, that's such a great, interesting thing because it's more of a hormone plant hormone than it is a fertilizer. And yeah. people often look at it as a fertilizer. And if you're looking at it as a fertilizer, you know, it's not something that's providing a lot of... There's not a lot of MPK in there. No, there's not. But what we're dealing with is hormones. And so it's trying to help regulate plant hormones that get it into a growing stage again, mm-hmm. which is very, very different than, you know, something that you see right away with like the NPK. Right. I mean, I've heard very intelligent people on both sides of this discussion, uh, you know, for and against it. Uh, I've seen it being gardening myths true and gardening myths false with intelligent people as well. Uh, so I would say uh, it tends to help stress plants, in my opinion, uh, but use it sparingly. And if you, if there's any question, a light liquid fertilizer can always be your friend because you're definitely putting some nitrogen in there to reform that bud formation. But uh, I, I've seen good success with it myself. I thought it was interesting, like you talked about with Ted Stevens. He actually soaks his rooted cuttings in Super Thrive right. before he sticks the rooted cuttings to come on. And he's like, "That's a genius, in my opinion." He's so. like, "They always perform better if I soak them yeah. in Super Thrive than if I just soak them in pure water." And I, it just, it, it's outstanding to hear somebody who is so right. well versed in plants who uses Super Thrive. And I've always said, "Give you Super Thrive if you've got a stressed plant that helps it back into a growing stage again." But don't count on it as a fertilizer. Don't it's count on a fertilizer. It's never going to be a fertilizer. Exactly. 
So guys, uh, we hope this has given you a little bit more insight into fertilizing Japanese maples and things to avoid, things to to go for. Um, it's one of our most commonly asked questions here at our nursery. My main thing I always beat like a drum is don't fertilize late into the season. That is the main thing, especially for us in Western North Carolina. I cut off all fertilizing hard here at May. So, I mean, I'll go and take all the fertilizers up. Uh, we'll, we'll take all of our stuff and hide it so it can't be fertilized after May. Trees that get potted up after May, they're just going to have to grow a little bit with some light liquids in moderation. They're not going to be getting a heavy granulated dose. Guys, I hope this has helped you understand a lot about fertilizing. I mean, fertilizing, it's, it's important. It makes the plants grow, but there's so many things that you can do wrong with it, but there's so many things you can do right with it too. I mean, you can really get a tree that grows beautifully and makes an amazing tree much faster when you're fertilizing with the proper amounts. Yeah, Japanese maples, you know, when you're doing it right, they, they like a little bit of fertilizer. It's going to make a better performing overall tree. You know, we hope this gives you some reasons why you should avoid overdoing it and why some reasons why you should look into fertilizing some of your trees. And uh, in the ground, uh, you're going to get better growth even when fertilized in the container. It's definitely going to need a little bit if you're going there long term. So I hope this has given you kind of a small outline. You know, we've talked about a lot of different things here today, but these are some of the things we've seen people do wrong and some of the things we know to do right from our own experiences. And that's what we like to do here on this talk show. We have a basically a weekly Japanese maple talk show where we discuss things that we discuss anyway. We just record it for you guys. So we like to interview interesting people uh, when it pertains to Japanese maples and gardening, provide that here on our podcast. And if you like that kind of thing, definitely check out the Mr. Maple Show on YouTube. We do seven days a week of gardening content there. We hope you'll subscribe and be part of our Maple Mafia and join that that friendship we have going on there. It's a really fun community of interesting people who are kind of fired up and crazy about Japanese maples. And if you're fired up and crazy about Japanese maples, also check us out on Facebook, in the Mr. Maple Friends group on Facebook. We've got a great group of people who are constantly posting photos of their Japanese maples. And there's just a great community there. And it, it's so fun to see those people just interact and see our plants growing and doing so well all around the country. Don't forget, guys, make sure to support us on MrMaple.com. We give away all this information free daily. And so if that's something you want to support, you can always shop on MrMaple.com. We had interesting plants every single week. Every Tuesday, we're adding 20 woody ornamentals. And every Friday, we're adding 10 fun flowering plants. Uh, there's always something new coming to Mr. Maple. So if you enjoy this kind of content, uh, the greatest way to support us is shopping on MrMaple.com. Thanks y'all so much. Take care. God bless. And have an awesome day.